So hi, I'm Robin Jeffries, and our speaker today is Austin Henderson, who is currently at Pitney Bowes, um, I've now forgotten, Concept and Innovation Lab, something close to that, uh, Advanced Concepts and Technology Lab. Um, Austin has a long history here in the Valley. Uh, he was at Park, um, when it was then called Xerox Park, I guess. He was at Apple, um, he was at, where else were you were here? Yeah, and Europe, Europe Park, and um, made some discursion into the Midwest to work at Richardson Fitch, um, and so he's had a long time interest in making systems that he calls more pliant, and he's going to talk to us today about that. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, the this is the this is the pitch um, that uh, computers as they're used in many circumstances, are quite rigid. Um, and life is very fluid, and there's a mismatch. Um, so what I want to do is talk today about uh, that problem, um, an analysis uh, of it, um, and some thoughts about what the solutions might be. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be uh, talking to this audience because I think in many ways the, the way you're using computers um, doesn't necessarily fit this mold. And so I'm particularly interested in your response to it. Um, so we'll just dive in. Um, in 1965, uh, in Montreal, I was uh, working uh, automating a, uh, a line, uh, a manufacturing line. And my job was to figure out how many bottles came in and reduce, it, take, take it off the, the, the number that were outstanding on the contracts. And I kept asking the systems department, um, is the, are the, what happens when the stuff that they ship me uh, is more than what's outstanding on the contract? What happens when the balance on the contract goes negative? And they said, that'll never happen. So a few more times uh, I kept asking, and eventually I got annoyed enough that I walked down to the, uh, the shipping dock and I said, what happens? They said, don't ask us, ask contracts. So I went to the guys in contracts and John said to me, it happens all the time. Um, the, the, um, there is breakage, there is quality control, there is delay, there is the fact that we're, everything's working just fine, only we haven't figured out the, what the price on the next contract's gonna be. For heaven's sakes, don't stop shipping. Keep it coming, have it go negative, and when we figure it out, we'll just pour it over to the other contract. And, and I said, oh my goodness, uh, I'm gonna have to go back to the systems department and explain to them all of this about the world, and, uh, and, and we'll build it into the program. And key learning moment for me, John said, don't. Don't build that all into the program. Um, and I said, why not? And he said, because tomorrow there's going to be a sixth reason. And there's going to be a seventh reason. What you need to build into the program is the tools that will allow me to build a model of the world and do the contracts as I need to do it. At that, so that particular uh, question for me is, how do you, uh, how do you um, begin to address all these questions? Uh, and the answer is, the users are the people in the end who are going to have to deal with these things and need to be able to address them. And that's what this is all about. So what role do the users play in, um, in, in doing design? Well, sort of the, the classic one is we, dream, we technical folks dream up something uh, and they have to just follow along. Uh, if we get better than that and go out and uh, study and observe, Users may become models for, for what we want, what the users need to be, and, 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 and we can then build uh, programs where the users are act really, if you will, are models uh, for, what, for, for the behavior we're trying to support. Uh, if we get better than that, we might involve the users in, in the design itself by participation. Uh, participatory design is all about how you engage users uh, in helping you design what needs to be designed. Um, what I'm looking at is pushing it farther than that, as my story might have just suggested, namely that you want to get the users into a position where they can do the design themselves. They can, in fact, begin to push, what is it that I need? 
Um, there, of course, are all the technical ways of doing that, where I can write scripts or do end users program, user programming. The tailoring and, and, and setting um, uh, preferences are, uh, of course, uh, things that uh, are, are sort of small steps down this route. But if you're trying to break out and, and, and get to something really rather different, you may need to get into the areas of construction sets and so on. But that's all way too technical for my friend John, probably, in contracts. So what do we do? Another example, uh, in 1968, uh, and, and, and so that experience for me was when I was a, in undergraduate school. And I went back to, I said, oh, this has got to be, there's got to be a science to this. So I went back to school and discovered I hadn't read the small print. The, uh, the fine print said that what computer science was about was about how you build the things, not how you use them. And so for years, I spent trying to find where was the place that you learned to actually how to use them. And eventually, when I was at Park, I tripped over the anthropologists and discovered that you, in fact, there's a whole science of how, it in fa how, in fact, you engaged users and understand what's going on in the world, what the needs and values might be, and then, beyond that, there is a whole collection of, 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 of disciplines in the area of design for figuring out not only where you are, but where you want to be. Um, this is a story that happened uh, early on in my days of the encounters with the anthropologists. Um, Eleanor Wynne, uh, an anthropologist, was looking at uh, Xerox order entry clerks, uh, the people who are on the telephones, taking uh, orders for uh, paper, ink, whatever. And uh, the exchange uh, was going uh, back and forth. Um, the, uh, the clerk said, um, uh, where should we ship it? The customer said, when are you going to ship it? Clerk says, uh, why the heck do you care? Answer, copiers on an ocean going barge. You tell me where, I'll tell you. Uh, you tell me when, I'll tell you where, OK? So in that moment, the clerk is confronted with something where they've taken the address and, and cranked it. They've, you've got ontological drift big time. Um, and so the clerk in that particular case, and this was 1968, and the clerk was working on paper, the clerk said, took numbers. Took a number, wrote down, call Bob. Now we don't know what happened when the shipping label got to the shipping dock and here's something called Bob, whether they actually got on the phone and called Bob. We know even less what happened when that address hit the, uh, hit the billing equipment and, they tried, and the billing equipment tried to figure out which state to charge sales tax in. Um, so it's not like the users deciding I'm going to go off in that direction uh, can be done with impunity. There, is, there are consequences, but this is what happened uh, uh, on paper. Um, the, the, the shift that I'm suggesting is a shift from designing uh, design as planning, what's going to happen, looking about what I'd ideally like to happen, and as much, and it's really additive rather than or, looking at design as evolving, looking at responding to a changing world, looking at the world you're in and it's delivering you new things uh, all the time, noticing how things are, looking backwards to see what has already happened rather than forward, or in addition to forward, as to what I'd like to happen. So there's, there, there's the, the, the shift that I'm saying that if we get our computation really useful to us, if we can get out there farther, the world, my dream world, will have the capacity for people to uh, be, be engaged with the machines in a much more creative way where the design is happening in response to what's going on. Um, a final example uh, at Pitney Bowes, we have, uh, like many companies, a lockbox company where when you pay us money, it gets shipped there. In, our, in, in, in uh, Pitney Bowes, the, uh, the lockbox is in Louisville, Kentucky. And so we refer to uh, all this, uh, this mail coming in is uh, going to Louisville. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that the mail, in addition to including checks, also includes uh, an unbelievable collection of other things, changes of addresses. Come pick up the meter. I've been sitting, uh, I've been asking you to pick it up for months. Um, I really would like to buy something else. Can I do it? On and on and on. A huge open-ended collection of comments uh, uh, from, the, from, our, from our customers. 
Now, the male people, or at least the lockbox people, tend to think of that as dirty mail. Um, that is to say, it isn't nice and clean and doesn't fit the business of give me a check, I'm giving you money. What they, what they do is they say, we've got all this other stuff, and they throw it in a box, and eventually they, uh, they send it to us. And what we, what we have to do is deal with it, we being the call centers, uh, the people who are dealing with customers. What, in looking at this, as you can imagine, some of us said, this isn't bad stuff. This is good stuff. This is the world telling you how it's changing. This is our customers doing the work of, 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 uh, of, of marketing everybody else to tell you what it is that they, what they need. And so they reach out. and everything. So we need to reconceptualize. And that whole process of dealing with that is something which wants to get, uh, get they, they constantly are having to redesign it. And they get into this business of they really want to redesign it in response to a changing world. Of course, if every customer, every user decides that they're going in a different direction, you get chaos, as I've suggested. So the question of how do we coordinate changes becomes a real issue if we succeed in getting um, the, the ability to design uh, as something that can happen uh, more quickly uh, or in the hands of the users. Um, so what I wanted to do now is talk um, quickly through some work that uh, Jed Harris and I uh, had, had been doing in the late 90s and, uh, and, and, and more recently um, around what we call pliant computing, looking at how do we address this problem? Because we all thought we wanted this, but what does it actually take? Um, the influences came from lots of places, as this slide suggests. Um, the, uh, the work was uh, initially uh, started uh, at, at Apple uh, and then has gone on and infected, infected other places. Uh, and uh, it was given uh, as a uh, paper at uh, Chi 90, uh, Chi 99, um, uh, focusing on this particular uh, line of argument. Here's the way it goes. There is um, a tension between computing and society, and I've given you some examples uh, to talk about that. I want to talk about the roots of that tension, um, a better way of thinking about it, and then a couple of, if you buy that, a couple of research agendas that, that suggests we might, uh, we might have to engage on. Um, the, uh, the examples uh, which I've given are very, uh, very small. The larger ways in which computation is, is, is forming a constituent part of, uh, of our, our, our world uh, are extensive, and you all know about them. Um, they're built into uh, the way our financial systems, our telecommunication systems, all of these systems work. Um, what those systems can do is often limited by what the computers can do that are built into them. The capacity for the organizations to deal with the world is limited by the computing and consequently our ability to change them. Um, put simply, I think what we have is for a, a, a social group doing something, um, you need to have uh, three, three sets of uh, criteria met. You'd like to be able to respond locally, as I've suggested. As the world, as the world, the particular circumstances that you're in are ones that you want to be able to respond to. On the other hand, if everybody rides off in all, at high speeds in all directions, you've got chaos. So you need to have some non-local coherence, some way of having those things encounter each other, such that changes that I proposed either get rejected, get bounced back. Somehow, the consequences um, get get uh, get handled. And then finally, which is sort of central to what we think about, is the real, so much the advantages of computers are scale. Namely, things get big. So getting two out of three of these things is hard. Getting all three is still pretty much of a challenge. Um, and that's what uh, we're really interested in thinking about. Um, there's really obviously sort of, it feels like, and I think it is, a, a, a trade-off between the, uh, the, uh, the responsiveness, your ability to change, to respond locally, and the uh, capacity for being coherent. Um, technology can sometimes uh, help you uh, uh, do a better, do, handling that trade-off, and scale makes it harder. Um, interesting, um, computers have tended to come down almost entirely on the side of the coherence. That is, we're going to maximize coherence very often. Um, the, uh, the usual way um, is, is to uh, sort of build in 
the answer that you're going to want, a single, uh, a single thing. And that, this puts a burden on all the users who have to deal with that, uh, the, the, uh, the need to respond. Um, where, where did this, this tension, you know, where did this come from? Uh, why are we there? Why did computers come down on the side of coherence rather than on the side of responsiveness? Um, the, 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 the current mythology about design is sort of the total consistency picture. Um, all our, um, the, the, the standard, it's, it's kind of standard to computer science that you think hard about a situation and then you decide what the model is and then you build that into the computing. In other words, there's this, this trying to get some model of the users and then all the, the users look the same. What we're going to do is then get a, we're going to have a single consistent thing. We, um, we, we build that in. Um, why did we get there? I think because uh, of, of something uh, that goes like this. It's a little sketch. Um, you have a bunch of people doing a bunch of things, acting in the world. And there's an interplay between those two as the world changes, the way, what they do changes. And there is this natural feedback that's going on between them. Um, after a while, as scale uh, begins to play its, its role, the, uh, you, you get people who are sort of saying, well, let's see if we can't organize things a little bit. Let's bring some people in who are going to coordinate things, who are going to begin to say how things should be done such that we can get, uh, so that we can, uh, don't have to reinvent it all the time, and so that we can, that we can manage uh, the, the, the thing as it gets bigger and bigger. They tend to write down something in the way of some form of a codification of the thing, a set of rules, something that says, here's the way you're supposed to behave. And then those are handed to the users who are supposed to now behave that way. Of course, the, the interaction loops are still there. And so the users listening to the, to, to the rules of I know what I'm supposed to do are, can still trade it off against what I'd like to do, what the pressures in the circumstances are. They can argue back with a coordinator said, in this particular situation, what ought I to do? Um, and, and so that there is still that feedback, but you're using the rules as, as a, a normative behavior around which uh, the, behavior, the, the, the activity is happening. Um, then the, bureaucrat the bureaucratic myth uh, comes along. And what it does is it forgets that there are those feedback loops. It basically says there are coordinators who are building rules and people are executing them and that's activity. Okay, CSAP. The, 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 what you do is you forget the incredible importance of the feedback loops and what you have is this picture. And then, of course, along come computers. Seems like the perfect device for doing rule following. Right? So we build a, uh, something which helps users follow the rules. We build the rules into the machinery, okay? Um, and then they have to act uh, in that way. Um, what happens, of course, is then things break because there isn't any way for the user to argue with the machine about what's supposed to happen. What then happens is that users step outside the machine and the system moves out into the social space around or into the paper space around or into calling your friend and what happens is the real system, the full socio-technical system, isn't inside the thing that you're looking at. So you don't, so you, from a point of view of an enterprise, you're really losing control of what's happened. The very device would look like it was going to help is the thing which has prevented you from getting real control of the situation. Um, and then, of course, scaling makes it worse and because any particular activity is has many of these things impinging on it. And if you solved it in one, it's not necessarily going to solve in the other. And the answers in one aren't going to work in the other. So it just, just gets very hard. Um, what could you do that would be better? Um, well, there are some non-solutions. Um, the classic AI solution, non-solution is if you make a big enough and sophisticated enough model, you can get it all. all right? We can, in fact, build something which will be smart enough that it will get it all right. Um, the problem there is, of course, how do you argue with it? Uh, we can also build adaptive systems, neural nets, those sort of things, all very useful. But 
we're not, we haven't yet built any really big um, uh, uh, skyscrapers out of marshmallows yet. The question of how you build big things out of stuff which isn't exactly fixed and rigid is something that we don't know how to do very well. Um, so the, these are, these are apparent, look, look like solutions, but in the end don't turn out to be. Um, what, we're, what we're suggesting is, uh, and this is work, as I've said, which is, is uh, mostly uh, Jed Harris and me, what we're suggesting is a, a much more of a form of a uh, dynamic um, uh, relationship, a dynamic engagement, um, scaling uh, without total cons co co consistency, uh, and having to work with, uh, it will drive us to work with much richer ontologies than we deal with now. Um, specifically, if you have different users doing different things, you're going to have multiple ontologies working uh, in the same space. Um, they'll be there concurrently, and you have to deal with uh, none of them necessarily being the privileged right answer, but all of them being ones which have a way of, 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 of uh, working with each other uh, and pushing on each other. These, in, th these uh, ontologies, I think, if we're going to get systems uh, which in the end will behave this way, are going to have to deal with the inconsistent, the vague, and the equivocal. We're going to have to have things which we don't understand fully yet. Um, the different ways that people look at things are often going to be uh, uh, mutually incommensurate where the way you think about taxes in France and the way you think about them in, in, in the US or between California and New York State are just plain different. Overtime in Connecticut is by the week and in California is by the day. And consequently, the, the way you struggle with these things, you can't say one is right and one is wrong. You could tempt, be attempted to say, well, let's go and get something which covers it all that's kind of in the same direction as going with the AI model. Let's get a, a great big ontology which covers it all. In reality, we build systems which live in the real world, and you'll always be crashing into something next. You will not have the, uh, the, le the um, luxury of being able to stop this system and, um, and, and, uh, and do something else. Now, I expect this is carrying coals to Newcastle here, because your system can, your systems continue to run. Um, that's, the, that's kind of the model that this suggests, an ongoing changing system which has got lots of different ways of looking at the world, which are then co-informing each other about where they are. The final thing, of course, is they're all drifting with respect to each other. But that is the way the world is. And I think if we're going to build computer systems, which, um, which are in the end going to be helpful in our world, we need to take this on. This has to be where we're going to go. Um, so if you buy, buy this, this, this goal of where we'd like to get to, where could we go? How can we get there? Um, I want to suggest two, uh, two research agendas. Um, one is um, by using the existing rigid computing systems, not pliant, in a very, in a, but use them in a pliant way. Take the pliant uh, agenda and use them uh, in a way which allows us to explore that. This is not particularly rocket science from a computer scientist's point of view, but it will be an upheaval and a half from management, uh, from a management and IT point of view. So that's going to be a social exercise as, more, as much as anything else. The second agenda, which I'll come to at the very end, and I would like to offer that there's going to be a solution, but I don't think we've got it yet. So in the end, I'm going to be offering a question rather than an answer, is we ought to do something with computers. Uh, there's a research sci a computer science agenda uh, that we need to deal with uh, uh, big time, and I'll come to that towards the end. So how about using uh, rigid computers uh, in a, a, a flexible way? Um, I'm going to uh, talk through an, a number of examples. Um, the first one was uh, the copier on the barge. I've already talked about it. Um, although the order entry clerk was using paper, um, if we were using computer systems, what could we do? Well, just being able to have a checkbox which says, the information in this field 
is something which I, human being, understand. You, computer, do not. Okay? The issue of being able to put information, unexpected values in the field, and then have the computing systems work out that, the, 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 the consequences of it. Not that they get smart, but rather that they hand it to a human being when they run into it and need to do something with it, which radically changes the way we think about the computer system. Um, not so much if the humans uh, are sitting there all the time and working with it, but it certainly changes it when you think about the big batch systems that are doing things behind the scenes uh, in these large systems like telephone companies and, uh, and, and, and power grids and so on. The question of how do, you, how do you build the humans who have to respond to the stuff that is out of band, how do you build that into the computer systems is as much a social problem and a user interface problem as it is a technical problem. You need to, but you need to identify the places. And I'm leaving it to the users to just to say, this is something you don't understand, and, but have the computers have the capacity to say, OK, I know I'm carrying stuff I don't understand and, and, and carry, it, carry it along. If you like, um, this is, the, um, this is the, the business of recognizing that there are limits to whatever the rigid, the rigid is. The second one uh, that I was, is, is putting margins on the form. Um, Joanne Yates, in a book called Control Through Communication, chronicled the invention of office procedures from 1885 to 1915. It's a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I suggest it. Um, I always assumed that uh, Julius Caesar's army ran on memos and had a uniform filing system. It didn't. That got invented. Um, that got invented when corporations' um, uh, headquarters and controlling uh, organizations became larger than four floors in one building. When they became distributed, as railroads did and chemical companies, suddenly you had to bring some agreement on how things were going to be done, such that there was a coherent manner of reporting and, uh, and, and adding things up so that the reports look the same. So, among other things, um, forms were invented. And the interesting thing about forms was that um, the initial forms um, were printed all the way to the edge of the page because they save on paper and who needs it? And what they discovered was that not everything fixed their rigid structure. And over time, they invented the margin. Okay. You hardly think of it as of an invention. But it's crucially important to exactly the subject matter we're talking about. That if you lay a rigid structure down over the world, then you better have a rigid place, an institutionalized place, for all the stuff that doesn't fit. Okay, And so what, what was invented was the margins on the form. So as, as, a, as a bumper sticker, mine, mine is margins on your form. Okay? This, is, this is think about when you build any system. Where's the stuff? What, what's the user going to do when it doesn't fit? No matter how well you do, what's the user going to do when it doesn't fit? And what are you going to do to respond to that? If you're going to say, we're not open for business on that, fine. But you're dealing, then you're admitting to the fact that it's going to be rigid, and the users are going to go outside. To the extent that you want to play and manage it, you better take it on. So as a very simple thing, you can always ask you, with respect to the systems I use, Pitney Bowes has a terrible one um, around, the, um, uh, around our um, uh, use of uh, support for some of our HR processes. And there's no place for putting margins on the form. There's no way of getting beyond the system. Um, we, uh, a, th a third one, uh, oh, and, and, and a thing to note is when you have these things which are out of the, the, the rigid structure that you've, you've been working on, if you've captured them, they stay inside the system. It allows the people to act. But it also traps where you can get at it the people who are building the rigid system. Uh, it, it traps for them the place where they can look to see what's outside, what they're not dealing with, what are the things that we ought to do in the next rev. And so you have access to all of this information if you can get people to stay inside your system. And so you enable the people who are using it, but you also enable the, 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 the uh, ongoing design. Um, you can use um, 
ecologies, uh, ecological growth of forms, uh, uh, of, of, um, of objects. There are various different things. This example here was something where we allowed um, uh, various different uh, scripts, bits of script, to be put behind a button and then sent around to other people. So people, so one person would build the script, which, and another person could use it. it this was at Europark uh, in uh, the late 80s, and what we noticed was um, a, a a a a huge eco ecology of these buttons. People building all sorts of things, adding to the extending their systems because they were working in a, a scriptable environment. Um, but what we noticed is that the um, the admins. Um, we're not we're not making use of it. We thought they would, so we sort of worked with them and gave them training sessions, and they weren't using it until the head of the lab made the made the comment to one of the admins, "I don't understand why you're not doing it." And the answer was, "Oh, is it okay for me to spend my time doing that sort of thing?" So the ecology of building these things was critically required permission for management required them to be able to uh, have an environment in which they could, could grow, um, uh, grow these buttons. Uh, again, that's, at the heart of that is the idea of a, a, a growable environment, but the business of handing it, the, the, the power to grow it between the experts and those who are not quite so expert. Um, obviously, um, the, uh, the web content uh, is, is, has, is, is growing, the fact that you can pull up the source on things and make use of it and then put it back in uh, has been a powerful way uh, of, of, of the, the, the behavior on the web, web growing. Um, feedback um, uh, on design, um, this, is, um, this is a whole other area of, of the system, not just its functionality, but the, uh, the, the, the information about how it's being used, how a particular system is being applied to particular circumstances. Often we use documentation or thing like it. The man pages in Unix were the earliest form where people could write your own documentation and extend it. That business of being able to talk about the usage patterns and grow that is nice because the, the, uh, the language for making the change uh, tends to be English or something like, I mean, a natural language, something that, that most users have access to. So that sort of gets, breaks beyond the, uh, the, the limitations of the, require, the, the necessity uh, to be technical to make the changes. And then finally, um, the, uh, uh, the social uh, coherence um, uh, control, the large development projects, open source. Uh, where, again, for those who can talk the language, th the social structures which allow for the uh, discussion and the management of the, uh, of, of the, of the handling of the coherence uh, is provided by the mechanisms that surround such things as open source. So those are the kinds of things that one can do uh, just with our existing systems to begin to move towards the space where you get a, a living, growing, uh, evolving, what we say, pliant system. Um, what you get is uh, the capacity for um, uh, the, the, the putting back into, into play as part of the computer systems the support for those feedback loops. Now, I was arguing that the, um, the, the, that is, is not as high as I'd like to raise the bar. Um, because what this leaves is the, the, uh, the information, uh, the, the changes that you're making, the shift in ontology, it's entirely in human space. You're getting no help from the computers uh, that you're using for handling the ontological drift, the, the changes in what an address means uh, in the, uh, uh, from, the, from those rigid systems because they're not playing in that, in that area. Uh, so the computers uh, are still dealing with rigid ontologies. Um, what we really like to do is, is get, the, get the computers somehow or other to help. Um, this, is the, 
this is sort of a hint uh, about how one, one way one might go about that. Um, this is based uh, on uh, Alexandrian patterns. And the, for those of you who know Christopher Alexander's work on architecture, the way the interplay between the regular uh, patterns that he would argue underwrites um, much of what con constitutes good architecture, how that is played out in the production of actual houses. Um, I want to talk very briefly uh, about these. Um, the thing that is uh, that, 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 that underwrites, that, that is sort of at the heart of this, as I suggested earlier, was instead of having uh, digital crisp values, sort of moving to values which are probably more continuous. It'll probably be more uh, like, like field interactions uh, rather than uh, uh, crisp edges uh, fitting into each other. It may very well be that the mechanisms will be probabilistic um, rather than logical. And the inference that, that, uh, that one would use might very well be like that. Um, and um, it will be dependent upon much, as, as Geertz would say, thicker descriptions of the, uh, of, of the system that the world, that the, um, of the ontology of the world that the system is playing in than we have now, which are, are really quite thin in the sense that the computers don't know much about the world uh, in which they are playing. Again, I don't ever expect the computers to be in the world the way we are, but there are ways in which I believe we can move somewhat in and get some help. Um, Christopher uh, proposed uh, a whole system of, uh, of patterns. Um, he referred to them, he called them a swirling intuition about form, um, a fluid field of relationships. He's talking about something that is a, if you like, a normative behavior of a particular area. Um, they're inherently metaphorical. Um, we use the idea uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of seeing as that the, the attempt, instead of instantiating um, classes, what one does is see the world as an instance of, um, uh, of a particular pattern. So it's the same way a patent is read by lawyers. Uh, it reads on a particular situation. You're looking for that match between the, the pattern and a rich world that's out there. When you've got that match, you can then, uh, you can then uh, use that as a way of saying uh, that, the, uh, that, that the, the changes in those worlds are, are going to read better or worse against the pattern. But more strongly than that, the attempt to read against the pattern may very well change your view of what the pattern is, as in, for example, that um, the the uh, the idea of a, of an address being changed by count encountering the copier on the barge. Um, the the way any given situation, instead of being an instance of a particular uh, a particular pattern, will be uh, seen as many of many patterns, and so that they will they will be pushing against each other, pushing to understand, to, to, to support that activity. And the idea behind it is that then, that you see it more as a collection of fields pushing things around. And the, and, and the, the attempt to see something new will push other things and cause ripples through the system. I've talked now already about enacting patterns. Um, the, the, uh, what you're trying to do is, um, is, is, is address the, 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 how, you, how you get the, the, the management um, uh, in order to, you need to be able to observe and, and, uh, and, and redirect what's happening as a way of controlling uh, what's going on. You, the business of calling for help that I talked about becomes part of this because of the mixed initiative where you have multiple people working on it. Um, you can have, in the midst of this, you can have conflicts, you can have uh, resolution, that, that the work uh, of, of the work 
is often the resolution of these pressures against each other. One of the things that, um, that is true of our uh, existing computer systems is that they tend to have a view, a single view of how the world is. Having multiple views means that it's a sandbox in which the clash of those, uh, of those ideas and those views and what you see it as can be worked out. If you look over time at what computer systems have uh, been used for, um, what they have been prostheses for, uh, you can see them move through arithmetic to memory to, ga to, to, to gathering to search. One of the things that interests me and what this would suggest is computers as a, a prosthesis for negotiation. How do we get the machines helping us in doing the real work of work, which is smashing different viewpoints against each other? If we can get them helping that, we can get the leverage that comes with that, maybe some of the very big problems, which are really the clash of different perspectives, might be something that we could get uh, the machinery actually helping and leveraging us uh, to do something about. Um, the history of how you got where you are uh, computationally is very much a part of, uh, of an acting. That things have done, that, that, that something has done something before becomes a, a piece of the force which is driving what's happening now. Uh, the fact that I, every time I enact something, that becomes a case where, ah, uh, yes, and the pattern still works, even if there's no change at all. So history uh, is, is, um, is, uh, is important. And quite clearly, from the feeling of this, um, the, the, the feeling would be that it's probably highly non-deterministic, that, that it's, it's, it's going to be uh, much, more, much more fluid uh, than, than we've, what we've got at the moment. Um, the, the, uh, the business of having collaborating activities is multiple, multiple patterns working on the same situation, massively parallel uh, diversity to maintain the right amount of coherence. What I've talked about here is, is the, the way of, of seeing things uh, as a way of, 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 uh, of, wrecking, of, of, of having the when you see something, what you're doing is you're bringing coherence out of the situation because you're seeing it as that and all the things that are of that pattern are then have been brought into some degree of coherence. How much effort you spend in doing that is a, man, is a management choice. What we did with, with computers where we, where we lock it down and say, here's the ontology and we're going to just live with it, is we've decided right in the very beginning that... Uh, we're going to put all of our effort on managing coherence into getting it right to start. This one says, no, no, we're making a, a different choice. We are going to have to actually spend resources in, in managing uh, those activities. Uh, and finally, uh, it's an evolving system. Um, it's large scale, ongoing, as I talked about. Again, these are just, that's just a hint of one way uh, that one might go about getting to a situation which uh, I, I think would look more like this. Namely that you have the people doing the work and the coordinators who are in fact building patterns, if you will, and maybe all of us are, but that the coordinators are producing, um, and you notice that the computer has now blurred out into the, the space in which work is happening, and that the, um, uh, that the the, the choice of how you manage uh, that your space and the coherence becomes real work necessary to then form the environment in which the ongoing uh, activity takes place. So that the computer system becomes much more uh, blurred out and the question of how you spend your resources on management becomes an active choice which everybody is making all the time. If you think about the way life is, this has very much this feeling. The question of can is for me, can we get computers to play too? Um, the bottom line is I want the designer, uh, the user, uh, to be the designer by being able to shape those uh, those 
those patterns and the world and have them reflect in the, the, the world that they live in, that uh, they can design it for themselves, that the system can help designers design it for themselves, the users define, design it for themselves, and that they can coordinate with each other. And so if there's a, another bumper sticker, it's really that the best of user-centered design has users designing, that is, at the center, building these systems which allow you to, to manage these multiple perspectives in, um, in, in, in a much more fluid world. Thank you. Um, so you talked about um, the sort of collision when the different road points don't align and you know, kind of work it out. Yep. You left that kind of big. Let me, these, in some of your examples, it seems like there's a pattern. So take the, um, the shipping, the supplies to the copier. Yep. Essentially, the people who organize the shipping form assume that if you, you know, if you give me this information, I can do my job. Yep. And the other person says, oh, but I can't do that. You can give that information because I know something else. Yep. If you tell me this, I can do the information. Essentially, it's a negotiation back and forth of what this information you provide. Yes. Is that a recurring theme? What fraction of clients is handled by that? And could you, in some sense, help automate that negotiation process by saying, well, all right, here's what more I need to be able to satisfy your worldview? Yes, to the extent that, 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 that at the point where the, the, uh, the user uh, says, okay, I'm going to put in call Bob. Um, the, the, to the extent that the system knows who else is going to use that information, it could engage them saying, do you got any problems with this? Again, I'm going at the level of the really, really uh, not smart uh, system, very, very simple systems just acting as, as a, uh, a platform for, for getting the information back. You can't, I mean, Richard Fikes and I, a long time ago, wrote around this particular example an argument that says if you really characterize your system and you know where every piece of information goes, then you'll be able to answer those questions. The problem is that some of the changes, that, 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 that some of the changes are, shift the ontology enough that you can't tell. You can't tell when things will matter and when not. So you really have to hand it to a person. The fact that you can use the system to do that is exactly what I think we would talk about. You know, it, you know, it, and then becomes a negotiation only at the level of, if that person is available right now, they may, they may be able to say, no, 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 no don't, don't get, make sure you get the full telephone number. Okay, but the, they may not be there real time. So the, 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 the difficulty, as, as I see it, is people are going to make a change and they're going to start acting on the basis of that. And then the, impl the impact of that is going to hit somebody else, and it's going to come rippling back through, and you have to deal with a partially completed activity in the face of a changing response, which is the way the world is. It's, you might have the luxury of getting the negotiation done before you settle on what the solution is. It's usually the case you get started and have to back out of it or struggle with it. Robin? So when you talk about the short-term climate changes, yeah. I'm often reminded of sort of modern aviation and the mm -hmm. fact that here you've got these systems that can do a lot of things, but the pilot is there to deal with the problems that the system can't handle. And that, you yeah. know, that, that so there's this interesting negotiation between the automated system and the pilot and who's in charge at any particular moment. But the thing that frightens me about it is, you know, the line about aviation, that it's hours of boredom punctuated by moments of terror. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, is that what, what our eventual computer systems are? Is, is you're there, you know, kind of because you have to be in the loop, and then there's a moment where out of nowhere you have to actually do something and you don't feel like you have the context to, to, to do it? That's a really good question. I think it done, if, if you make um, certain management decisions in certain ways, that's exactly what you'll get. Um, and I, but I don't think that you'll be, you'll be driven to that because I think that the solution that's taken in air traffic, you know, with, with, with pilots flying, is you keep them in the loop. You don't have them just sitting out there looking over, over the shoulder, but rather they're actively involved. 
Um, and, and, and so the question of how you, how, how you let a person who is going to have to answer the question of what about this a new address, how you, how you let them see those things that are coming. What's going on? Can I look, can I see what's happening out there? Can I take the world's information and, 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 and notice what's happening? Possibly I can anticipate, possibly I actually, I can lead. But, but, but I need to, if, if, if I don't stay involved, you're absolutely right, I won't be able to. I won't be able to make that decision. But yes? I see that enough in the talk of, you know, not only do I need this ability to cooperate and negotiate, but I need to have the context um, that I would have had back when I did it all manually so that I can understand what I'm cooperating and negotiating about. Exactly. And so the question of how, how as a necessary part of doing this, we have to have the machines providing that. I mean, back to John's question, of, of how do you provide that negotiation? If you're negotiating, I have to know where they are. How do I see that? It may be, again, the same sort of answer that we can, in fact, take a partial solution. Air, air traffic control is, a, a, is one which says, no, you can't. You have to decide. But very often, dis solutions can be made which can then be rethought and, 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 and reworked. Exactly what this kind of system looks like in the face of Sarbanes-Oxley um, I don't know, uh, and I think because that's, you know, th those that legislation is built around a, a a perception that the world is regular and you can plan it, and activity is based on the rules. All right, so there, there there's a there's a this is a, a fundamental sort of head-on clash with with that perspective uh, on 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 activity. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Yes, you. Yeah. So Sorry. Um, I was somewhat intrigued by the connection between what software correctness people talk about in terms of preconditions and postconditions, as you were describing this problem of trying to define everything too rigidly and then things breaking because you either overspecified things or and because you overspecified things, things went outside the system in order to finish the thing. So how do you sort of see the correlation? Because one way you can think about this is to say, don't over-specify. Specify your preconditions and post-conditions. And between those two, how those things get met, even if they happen out of band, then provide the right connection points where you come back into the system so that what you then have on the software side is something coherent. Even though you, so you essentially acknowledge that there is more than computers. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think at the, at the center, to the extent that I, I understand your your solution, the extent to which you say we start by acknowledging there's more than computers, leave it outside, the, the you know it steps outside as long as they bring it back inside, in the within band as as you say, then 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 uh, th then it'll fit. The question, the harder question is, when you step outside. And, and get a solution outside um, if the solution requires the change of what's inside. So you can't bring it back in band without changing the system. That basically then is symptomatic of the fact that your preconditions and postconditions are wrong. If you're not able to come back in correctly. So you're saying that when you bring it back into the system, we, we've suddenly realized, wait, things do change. OK, so that the preconditions condition is I need to know how many people are there in this room. And when I'm done, the post condition is I know how many people are there in this room. How I did that, whether I went around and asked everybody to put a piece of paper in a box and then I count the piece of paper or whether I told them to raise their hands and I count the hands, is outside the system. But you know, you, you then have a consistent view of the world. But, but the difficulty will be, the, the one that, that's fine when that works. The one that I was pointing at is when the answer that comes back in is, oh, I see, this circumstance is, uh, is saying that, that I have to re-understand what the notion of, of counting people is, or be, because, because you've changed the ontology. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a deep problem. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to end so yeah. the next okay. speaker can go. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you.